Hello and welcome. My name is Alan and today we are back with more. A test of my hope of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We are reading, picking up reading the book. Um, Stride Toward Freedom. I almost couldn't read that. My eyes are so bad off. But we're going to read chapter 4, 5, and 6, which 4 has got a decent length, but 5 and 6 are fairly short. So let's hop into this. Chapter 4, The Day of Days, the 5th of December. My wife and I awoke early from... earlier than usual on Monday morning. We were up and fully dressed by 5.30. The day for the protest had arrived and we were determined to see the first day of this unifying unfolding dream. I was still saying that if we could get 60% cooperative the Venture would be a success. Fortunately, a bus stop was just five feet uh, from our house. This meant that we could observe the opening stages from our front window. The first bus was to pass around six o'clock and so we waited through uh, as indeterminable an indeterminable half hour. Uh, I was in the kitchen drinking my coffee when I heard Coretta cry, Martin, Martin, come quickly. I put down my cup and ran toward the living room. As I approached the front window, Coretta pointed joyfully to a slowly moving bus. Darling, it's empty. I could hardly believe what I saw. I knew that the South Jackson line could hardly, or which ran past our house, carried more Negro passengers than any other line in Montgomery, and that this first bus was usually filled with domestic workers going to their jobs. Would all of these buses follow the pattern that had been set by the first? Eagerly we waited for the next bus. In 15 minutes it rode down the street and it and like the first it was empty. A third bus appeared and it too was empty. Of all but two white passengers. I jumped in my car and for almost an hour I cruised down every major street and examined every passing bus. During this hour at the peak of the morning traffic I saw no more than eight Negro passengers 
riding the buses. By this time, I was jubilant. Instead of the 60% cooperation we had hoped for, it was becoming apparent that we had reached almost 100%. A miracle had taken place. The once dormant and quiescent Negro community has, was now fully awake. All day long it was confirmed, but the afternoon peak, the buses were still as empty of Negro passengers as they had been in the morning. Students of Alabama State College, who usually kept the South Jackson bus crowded, were cheerfully walking and thumbing rides. Job holders had either found other means of transportation or made their way on foot. While some rode in cabs or private cars, others used less conventional means. Men were seeing riding mules to work, and more than one horse-drawn buggy drove the streets of Montgomery that day. During the rush hours and the sidewalks were crowded with laborers and domestic workers, many of them well past middle age, trudging patiently to their jobs and home again. Sometimes as much as 12 miles, they knew why they walked, and the knowledge was evident in the way they carried themselves. And as I watched them, I knew that there is nothing more majestic than the determined courage of individuals willing to suffer and sacrifice for their freedom and dignity. Many spectators had gathered at the bus stops to watch what was happening. At first, they stood quietly, but as the day progressed, they began to cheer and the empty buses and laugh and make jokes. Noisy youngsters could have been heard singing out, No riders today, trailing each bus through the Negroes section were two policemen on motorcycles, assigned by the city commissioners, who claimed the Negro goon squads had been organized to keep other Negroes from riding the buses. In the course of the day, the police su succeeded in making one arrest, a college student who was helping the elderly woman across the street was charged with intimidating passengers, but the goon squads existed only in the commission's imagination. No one was threatened or intimidated for riding the buses. The only harassment anyone faced was that of his own conscience. Around 9.30 in the morning, I tore through, I tore myself from the action of the city streets and headed for the crowded police court. Here, Miss Parks was being tried for di disobeying the city segregation ordinance. Her attorney, Fred D. Gray, the brilliant young Negro who later became the chief counsel for the protest movement, was on hand to defend her. After the judge heard the arguments, he found Miss Parks guilty and fined her $10 and court costs a total of $14. She appealed the case. This was one of the first clear-cut instances in which a Negro had been 
convicted for disobeying the segregation in which uh, the desegregation law or segregation law. In the past, either cases like this had been dismissed or the people involved had been charged with disorderly conduct. On the, so in the real sense, participating uh, factor to arouse the Negroes to positive action, and it was a test of validity of the segregation law itself. I am sure that supporters of such prosecutions would have acted otherwise if they had the uh, prescience to look beyond the movement or moment. <clears throat> Chapter 5 Leaving Miss Parks' trial, Ralph Abernathy, E.D. Nixon, and Reverend E. N. French, then minister of the Hilliard Chapel AME Zion Church, discussed the need for some organization to guide and direct the protest. Up to this time, things had moved forward more or less spontaneously. These men were wise enough to see that the moment had now come for a clear order and direction. Meanwhile, Roy Bennett, who called several people together at three o'clock to make plans for the evening mass meeting, everyone present was elated by the tremendous success and had already attended the protest. But beneath this feeling, was the question, where do we go from here? When E.D. Nixon reported on his discussion with Abernathy and French earlier in the day, and their suggestion for an ad hoc organization, the group responded enthusiastically. The next job was to elect the officers for the new organization. As soon as Bennett had opened the nominations for president, Rufus Lewis spoke from the far corner of the room. Mr. Chairman, I would like to nominate Reverend M. L. King for president. The motion was seconded and carried. And in a matter of m minutes, I was unanimously elected. The action had caught me unawares. <clears throat> it had happened so quickly that I did not even have time to think about it, um, th to think it through. It is probable that if I had, I would have declined the nomination. Just three weeks before, several members of the local chapter of the NAACP had urged me to run for the presidency of that organization, uh, assuring me that I was certain of election. After my wife and I had discussed the matter, we agreed that I should not take on any heavy community responsibilities. Since I had so recently finished my thesis um, and needed to give more attention to my church work. But 
on this occasion events had moved too fast. In the election of the remaining officers was speedily completed. Reverend Elroy Bennett, Vice President. Reverend U.J. Fields, Recording Secretary. Reverend E.N. French, Corresponding Secretary. Miss Erna A. Dungy, Financial Secretary. And Mr. E.D. Nixon, Treasurer. I was then, it was then agreed that all those present would constitute the executive board of the new organization. This, organi this board would serve as the coordinating agency of the whole movement. It was a well-balanced group, including ministers of all denominations, school teachers, businessmen, and two lawyers. The new organization needed a name and several were suggested. Someone proposed the Negro Citizens Committee, and this was rejected because it resembled too closely the White Citizens Council. Other suggestions were made and dismissed until finally Ralph Abernathy offered a name that was agreeable to all, the Montgomery Improvement Association, MIA. With these organizational matters behind us, we turn to a discussion of the evening meeting. Several people not wanting the reporters to know our future <clears throat> moves suggested that we just sing and pray if there were specific recommendations to be made to the people these could be mammographed and passed out secretly during the meeting first they felt would leave the reporters in the dark Others urged that something should be done to conceal the true identity of the leaders, feeling that if no particular name had, was revealed, it would be safer for all involved. After a rather lengthy discussion, E.D. Nixon rose impatiently. We are acting like little boys, he said. Somebody's name still, somebody's name will have to be known. And if we are afraid, we might just as well vote up right now. We must also be men enough to discuss our recommendations in the open. This idea of secretly passing something around in paper as a is a lot of bunk. The white folks are eventually going to find out anyway. We'd better decide now if we are going to be fearless men or scared boys. With this forthright statement, the air was cleared. Nobody could again suggest that we try to conceal our identity or avoid facing the issue head on. Nixon's courageous affirmation had given new heart to those who were about to be crippled by fear. It was unanimously agreed that the protests should continue until certain demands were met and that a committee under the chairmanship of Ralph Abernathy would draw up the, those demands in the forms of resistance or restitution and present them 
to the evening mass meeting uh, for approval. We worked out the remainder of the program quickly. Bennett would preside and I would make the main address. Remarks by a few other speakers along with scripture reading, prayer, hymns, and collection would round out the program. Immediately, the resolution committee set to drafting its statement despite our dissatisfaction at the success of the protest so far. We were still concerned would the evening meeting be well attended? Could we hope that the fortitude and enthusiasm of the Negro community would survive more than one such day of hardship. Someone suggested that perhaps we should reconsider our decision to continue the protest. Would it not be better, said the speaker, to call off the protest while it is still a success rather than let it go on a few more days and sizzle out, fizzle out? We have already proved our united strength to the white community. If we stop now, we can get anything we want from the bus company simply because they will have the feeling that we can do it again. But if we continue, the mo and most of the people return to the buses tomorrow or the next day, the whole the white people will laugh at us, and we will end up getting nothing. This argument was so convincing that we almost resolved to end the protest, but we finally agreed to let the ma to let the mass meeting, which was only about an hour off, be our guide. If the meeting was well attended, and the people were enthusiastic, we would continue. Otherwise, we would call off the protest that night. Give me one moment here, I'm just checking something. Okay. I'm sorry. Right. I went home for the first time since seven that morning and found Coretta relaxing from a long day of telephone calls and general excitement. After we had brought each other up to date, on the city's developments, I told her somewhat hesitantly, not knowing what her reaction would be, that I had been elected president of the new association. I need not have worried. Naturally surprised, she still saw that since the responsibility had fallen on me, I had no alternative but to accept it. She did not need to be told that we would now have even less time together. And she needed, uh, she seemed undisturbed by the possible danger of all of us in my new position. You know, she said quietly, that whatever you do, you have my backing. Reassured, I felt I went to my study and closed the door. The minutes were passing fast. It was now 6.30 and I had to leave 
no later than 6.50 to get to the meeting. This meant that I had only 20 minutes to prepare the most decisive speech in my life. As I thought of the limited time before uh, me and the implication of the this speech, I had become possessed by fear. Each week I needed at least 15 hours to prepare my Sunday sermon. Now I was faced with the inescapable task of preparing an almost, in almost no time at all, a speech that was expected to give a sense of direction to a people imbued with a new and still unplumbed passion for justice. I was also conscious that reporters and television men were will be there with their pencils and sound cameras poised to record my words and send them across the nation. Okay. Um, I was now almost overcome, obsessed by a feeling of inadequacy in this state of anxiety. I had already wanted five minutes of the original 20. I had already wasted five minutes of the original 20 with nothing left but faith in a power whose matchless strength stands over against the frailties and inadequacies of human nature, I turned to God to in prayer. My words were brief and simple, asking God to restore my balance and to be with me in a time when I needed his guidance more than ever. With less than 15 minutes left, I began preparing an outline. In the middle of the, this, however, I faced a new and sobering dilemma. How would I make a speech that would be militant enough to keep my people aroused to positive action and yet moderate enough to keep their, their fervor within controllable and Christian bounds? I knew that many of the Negro people were victim of bitterness and that could easily rise to flood proportions. What could I say to keep them, them courageous and prepared for positive action and yet devoid of hate and resentment? Could the militant and the moderate be combined in a single speech? I decided that I had to face the challenge head on and attempt to combine two apparent ir irreconcilables. I would seek the to arouse the group to action by insisting that their self-respect was at stake and that if they accepted such injuries without protesting, they would betray their own sense of dignity and the eternal edicts of God himself. But I would balance this with a strong affirmation of the Christian doctrine of love. By the time I had sketched an outline of the speech in my mind, 
my time was up. Without stopping to eat supper, I had not eaten since morning. I said goodbye to Coretta and drove to the Hope Street Church. Within five blocks of the church, I noticed a traffic jam. Cars were lined up as far as I could see on both sides of the street. It was a moment before it occurred to me that all of these cars were headed for the mass meeting. I had to park at least four blocks from the church, and as I started walking, I noticed that hundreds of people were standing outside. In the dark night, police cars circled slowly around the area, surveying the orderly, patient, and good-humored crowd. The three or four thousand people who could not get into the church were to stand for about, were to stand cheerfully throughout the evening, listening to the proceedings on the loudspeakers that had been set up outside for their benefit. And when near the end of the meeting, these speakers were silenced at the request of the white people in the surrounding neighborhoods, the crowd would still remain quietly, content simply to be present. It took fully 15 minutes to push my way through to the pastor's study where Dr. Wilson told me that the church had been packed since five o'clock. <clears throat> By now, my doubts concerning the continued success of our venture were dispelled. The question of calling off the protest was now academic. The, enthusias uh, the enthusiasm of the thousands of people swept everything along like an onrushing tidal wave. It was some time before the remaining speakers could push their way to the rostrum through the tightly packed church. When the meeting began, it was almost half an hour late. The opening hymn was the old familiar Onward Christian Soldiers. And when the mammoth audience stood to sing, the voices outside swelling the chorus in the church, there was a mighty ring like the glad echo of heaven itself. Reverend W.F. Alford, minister of the Beulah Baptist Church, led his congregation in prayer, followed by reading of the scripture by Reverend U.J. Fields, minister of the Bell Street Baptist Church. Then the chairman introduced me. As the audience applauded, I rose and stood before the pulpit. Television cameras began to shoot from all sides. The crowd grew quiet. Without manuscript or notes, I found the story of what had happened to Mrs. Parks. Then I reviewed the long history of abuses and insults 
that Negro citizens had experienced on the city buses. But there comes a time, I said, that people have get tired. We are this evening to say to those who have mistreated us so long that we are tired, tired of being segregated and humiliated, tired of being kicked about by the brutal feet of oppression. The congregation met this statement with Fervent applause. We had no alternative but to protest, I continued. For the many years, we have known amazing patience. We have shown amazing patience. We have sometimes given our white brothers the feeling that we liked the way we were being treated. But we come here tonight to be saved from the patience that makes us uh, patient with anything less than freedom and justice. Again, the audience interrupted with applause. Briefly, I justified our actions both morally and legally. One of the great glories of democracy is the right to protest for right. Comparing our methods with those of the white citizens' councils and the Ku Klux Klan, I pointed out that while these organizations were protesting for the perpetuation of injustice in the community, we were protesting for the birth of justice in the community. Their methods lead to the violence and the lawlessness, but in our protest there will be no cross burnings. No white person will be taken from their home by hooded Negro mob and brutally murdered. There will be no threats and intimidation. We will be guided by the highest principle of law and order. With this groundwork for militant action, I moved on to the words of caution. I urge the people not to face anybody in refrain from the riding the buses. Our method must be that of persuasion, not coercion. We will only say to the people, let your conscience be your guide. Emphasizing the Christian doctrine of love, our actions must be guided by the deepest principle of our Christian faith. We must be regulating this must be the regulating idea. Once again we must hear the words of Jesus echoing across the centuries. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you and pray for them that despitefully use you. If we fail to do this, our protest will end up as a meaningless drama um, on the stage of history and the memory will be shrouded with the ugly garments 
of shame in spite of the unrest and the mistreatment that we have confronted. We must become better and end up hating our we must become we must not become bitter and end up hating our white brothers. As Booker T. Washington said, let no man pull you so low as to make you hate him. Once more, the, the audience responded enthusiastically. Then came the closing argument. If you will protest courageously and let your dignity and Christian love uh, oh, if you protest courageously and yet with dignity and Christian love, when the history books are written in future generations, the historians will have to pause and say they live there lived a great people, a black people, who injected new meaning and dignity into the veins of civilization. This is our challenge and our overwhelming responsibility. As I look, as I took my seat, the people rose to their feet and applauded. I was thankful to God that the message had uh, gotten over and that the task of combining the militant and the moderate had been at least partially accomplished. The people had been as enthusiastic when I urged them to love as they were when I urged them to protest. As I sat listening to the continued applause, I realized that this speech had evoked more response than any speech or sermon. I had ever delivered, and yet it was virtually unprepared. I came to see for the first time what the older preachers meant when they said, open your mouth and God will speak for you. While I would not let this experience tempt me, to overlook the need for continued preparation, it would always remind me that God can transform man's weakness into a glorious opportunity. When Mrs. Parks introduced from the rostrum by E.N. French, the audience responded by giving her a standing ovation. She was their heroine. They saw her in her courageous person, the symbol of their hopes and aspirations. Now the time had come for the all-important resolution. Ralph Abernathy read the words slowly and forcefully. The main substance of the resolution called upon the Negroes not to resume riding buses until one courteous treatment by the bus operators was guaranteed. Two, passengers were seated on a first-come, first-served basis. Negro uh, seating from the back of the bus 
toward the front while white seated from the front toward the back. Three, Negro uh, bus operators were employed on predominantly Negro routes. At this, at the words, all in favor of the motion stand. Every person in the in, uh, to a man stood up, and those who were already standing raised their hands. Cheers began to ring out from both inside and outside. The motion was carried unanimously. The people had expressed their determination not to ride the buses until conditions were changed. At this point, I had to leave the meeting and rush to the other side of the um, town to speak at a YMCA banquet. As I drove away, my heart was full. I had never seen such enthusiasm for freedom. And yet, this enthusiasm was tempered by amazing self-discipline. The unity of purpose and spirit, de spirit decor of these people had been indescribably moving. No historian would ever be able to fully describe this meeting, and no socialist or so sociologist would ever be able to interpret it adequately. One had to be a part of the experience, really, to understand it. At the Benmore Hotel, as the elevator slowly moved up to the roof garden toward the banquet, where the banquet was being held, I said to myself, the victory is already won. No matter how long we struggle to attain the three points of the resolution. It is a victory in infinitely larger than the bus situation. The real victory was in the mass meeting where thousands of black people stood revealed with a new sense of dignity and destiny. Many will inevitably raise the questions, why did the event take place in Montgomery, Alabama in 1955? Some have, have suggested the Supreme Court decision on school desegregation handed down less than two years before had given new hope of eventual justice to Negroes everywhere and fired them with the necessary spark of encouragement to rise against their oppression. But although this might help to explain why the protest occurred when it did, it cannot explain why it happened in Montgomery. Certainly, there is a partial explanation in the long history of injustice on the buses of Montgomery. The bus protest did not spring into being full-grown as Athena sprang from the head of Zeus. It was a culmination of a slowly developing 
process. Mrs. Park's arrest was the precipitating factor rather than the cause of the protest. The cause lay deep in the record of similar occurrence injustices. Almost everybody could point to an unfortunate episode that he himself had experienced or seen. But there comes a time when people get tired of being trampled by oppression. There comes a time when people get tired of being plunged into the abyss of exploitation and nagging injustice. The story of Montgomery is the story of 50,000 such Negroes who were willing to substitute tired feet for tired souls and walk the streets of Montgomery until the walls of segregation were fully battered by the forces of justice. But neither in is the whole explanation. Negroes in other communities confronted um, conditions equally as bad and often worse. So we cannot explain the Montgomery story merely in terms of the abuses of Negroes suffered there. Moreover, it cannot be explained by the persistent unity among the leaders, since we have seen that the Montgomery Negro community prior to this protest was marked by divided leadership, indifference, and complacency. Nor can it be explained by the appearance upon the scene of new leadership. The Montgomery story would have taken place if the leaders of the protest had never been born. So every rational explanation breaks down at these at some point. There is something about the protest that is supernatural. It cannot be explained without a divine dimension. Some say, some may call it a principle of concretion with Alfred uh, with Alfred in Whitehead, or a process of integration with Harry in Wyman, or being itself with Paul Tillich, or a personal God. Whatever the name, some extra human force labors to create a harmony out of the discord of the universe. There is a creative power that works to pull down mountains of evil and level hilltops of injustice. God still works through history, his wonders to perform. It seems as though God had decided to uh, use Montgomery as the proving ground for the struggle and triumph of freedom and justice in America. And what better place for it than the day that Montgomery, the cradle of the Confederacy, 
is being transformed into a Montgomery, the cradle of freedom and justice. After the day of days, Monday, December the 5th, 1955, was drawing to a close. We all prepared to go to our homes, not yet fully aware of what had not been forgotten. That night, we were starting a movement that would be not forgotten. A movement that would gain national recognition. Whose echoes would ring in our ears of people of the nation. A movement that would astound the opponent. And bring every, bring new hope to the opponent. That night was Montgomery's moment in history. All right, that is all of chapter four. I'm sorry it took so long. Uh, my eyes are having trouble adjusting to try to read. These are lineless bifocals and I'm just having trouble seeing. So I'm trying to get used to them. I apologize for, uh, yeah, everything. But anyway, Dr. King uh, is discussing the setup to the Montgomery bus boycott and the first day of it. And we see, you know, the unity of the community especially in the black community. He still wants it to be passionate, but kind. So yeah. But, as always, educate thyself. Think, read, study, learn. Someone tries to tell you something you have trouble believing, ask them to cite their sources. I'll see you all in the next video. Until then, later.